Book One, Canto Four of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto Four. To sinful house of pride, Duessa guides the faithful knight, where brother's death to wreak, sans joy doth challenge him to fight. Young knight, whatever that dost arms profess, and through long labors huntest after fame. Beware of fraud, beware of fickleness, in choice and change of thy dear loved dame, lest thou of her believe too lightly blame, and rash misweening do thy heart remove. For unto night there is no greater shame than lightness and inconstancy in love. That doth this Red Cross Knight's example plainly prove. Who, after that he had fair Una lorn, through light misdeeming of her loyalty, and false Duessa in her stead had borne, called Fides, and so supposed to be, long with her travelled, till at last they see a goodly building, bravely garnished, the house of mighty prince it seemed to be, and towards it a broad highway that led, all bare through people's feet which thither travelled. Great troops of people travelled thitherward, both day and night, of each degree and place, but few returned, having scaped hard with baleful beggary or foul disgrace, which ever after in most wretched case like loathsome lazars by the hedges lay. Thither Duessa bade him bend his pace, for she is weary of the toilsome way, and also nigh consumed is the lingering day. A stately palace built of squared brick, which cunningly was without mortar laid, whose walls were high but nothing strong nor thick, and golden foil all over them displayed, that purest sky with brightness they dismayed. High lifted up were many lofty towers, and goodly galleries far overlaid, full of fair windows and delightful bowers, and on the top a dial told the timely hours. It was a goodly heap for to behold, and spake the praises of the workman's wit, but full great pity that so fair a mould did on so weak foundation ever sit. For on a sandy hill that still did flit and fall away, it mounted was full high, that every breath of heaven shaked it and all the hinder parts that few could spy were ruinous and old, but painted cunningly. Arrived there, they passed in forthright, for still to all the gates stood open wide, yet charge of them was to a porter height called Malvenu, who entrance none denied. Thence to the hall, which was on every side with rich array and costly arras dight, Infinite sorts of people did abide there, waiting long to win the wished sight of her that was the lady of that palace bright. By them they pass, all gazing on them round, and to the presence mount, whose glorious view their frail, amazed senses did confound. In living prince's court, none ever knew such endless riches and so sumptuous you. Ne Persia self, the nurse of pompous pride, like ever saw. And there a noble crew of lords and ladies stood on every side, which with their presence fair the place much beautified. High above all a cloth of state was spread, and a rich throne as bright as sunny day, on which there sate, most brave, embellished with royal robes and gorgeous array, a maiden queen that shone as Titan's ray in glistering gold and peerless precious stone, yet her bright blazing beauty did essay to dim the brightness of her glorious throne, as envying herself that too exceeding shone. Exceeding shone like Phoebus' fairest child that did presume his father's fiery wain, and flaming mouths of steeds unwanted wild through highest heaven, with weaker hand to reign. Proud of such glory and advancement vain, while flashing beams do daze his feeble line, he leaves the welkin way most beaten plain, and wrapped with whirling wheels in flames the skine with fire not made to burn, but fairly for to shine. So proud she shined in her princely state, looking to heaven, 
for earth she did disdain, and sitting high, for lowly she did hate. Lo, underneath her scornful feet was lain a dreadful dragon with an hideous train, and in her hand she held a mirror bright, wherein her face she often viewed fain, and in her self-loved semblance took delight. For she was wondrous fair as any living wight. Of grisly Pluto she the daughter was, and sad Proserpina the queen of hell. Yet did she think her peerless worth to pass that parentage, with pride so did she swell, and thundering Jove that high in heaven doth dwell and wield the world she claimed for her sire, or if that any else did Jove excel, for to the highest she did still aspire, or if aught higher were than that, did it desire. And proud Lucifera men did her call, that made herself a queen and crowned to be, yet rightful kingdom she had none at all, the heritage of native sovereignty, but did usurp with wrong and tyranny upon the sceptre which she now did hold, ne ruled her realms with laws, but policy, and strong advisement of six wizards old, that with their counsels bad her kingdom did uphold. Soon as the elfin knight in presence came, and false Juessa, seeming lady fair, a gentle husher, vanity by name, made room, and passage for them did prepare, so goodly brought them to the lowest stair of her high throne, where they, on humble knee, making obeisance, did the cause declare why they were come her royal state to see, to prove the wide report of her great majesty. With lofty eyes, half loath to look so low, she thanked them in her disdainful wise, Nay other grace vouchsafed them to show a princess worthy, scarce them bad arise. Her lords and ladies all this while devise themselves to set and forth to stranger sight. Some frounce their curled hair in courtly guise, some prank their ruffs, and others trimly dight their gay attire. Each other's greater pride does bite. Goodly they all that night do entertain, right glad with him to have increased their crew. But to duess each one himself did pain all kindness and fair courtesy to shew, for in that court while home her well they knew. Yet the stout fairy, amongst the middest crowd, thought all their glory vain in knightly view, and that great princess too exceeding proud, that to strange knight no better countenance allowed. Sudden apriseth from her stately place the royal dame, and for her coach doth call, all hurtling forth, and she with princely pace, as fair Aurora in her purple pall, out of the east the dawning day doth call, so forth she comes, her brightness broad doth blaze, the heaps of people thronging in the hall do ride each other upon her to gaze, her glorious glitter and light doth all men's eyes amaze, so forth she comes, and to her coach does climb, adorned all with gold and girlands gay, that seemed as fresh as Flora in her prime, and strove to match in royal rich array great Juno's golden chair, the which, they say, the gods stand gazing on when she does ride to Jove's high house through heaven's brass-paved way, drawn of fair peacocks that excel in pride, and full of Argus eyes their tails to spread and wide. But this was drawn of six unequal beasts, on which her six sage counsellors did ride, taught to obey their bestial behests, with like conditions to their kinds applied, of which the first, that all the rest did guide, was sluggish idleness, the nurse of sin. Upon a slothful ass he chose to ride, arrayed in habit black, and amice thin, like to an holy monk, the service to begin, and in his hand his portess still he bare, that much was worn, but therein little red, for of devotion he had little care, still drowned in sleep, and most of his days dead, scarce could he once uphold his heavy head, to look on whether it were night or day, may seem the wain was very evil led, when such an one had guiding of the way, that knew not whether right he went or else astray. 
from worldly cares himself he did esloin, and greatly shunned manly exercise, from every work he challenged a soin for contemplation's sake, yet otherwise his life he led in lawless rioties, by which he grew to grievous malady, for in his lustless limbs, through evil guise, a shaking fever reigned continually. Such one was idleness, first of this company. And by his side rode loathsome gluttony, deformed creature on a filthy swine. His belly was a-blown with luxury, and eke with fatness swollen were his eyne, and like a crane his neck was long and fine with which he swallowed up excessive feast, for want whereof poor people oft did pine, and all the way, most like a brutish beast, he spewed up his gorge, that all did him detest. In green vine leaves he was right fitly clad, for other clothes he could not wear for heat, and on his head an ivy garland had, from under which fast trickled down the sweat. Still as he rode, he somewhat still did eat, and in his hand did bear a boozing can, of which he supped so oft, that on his seat his drunken course he scarce upholden can, in shape and life more like a monster than a man. Unfit he was for any worldly thing, and eke unable once to stir a go, not meet to be of counsel to a king, whose mind in meat and drink was drowned so, that from his friend he seldom knew his foe. Full of diseases was his carcass blue, and a dry dropsy through his flesh did flow, which by misdiet daily greater grew. Such one was gluttony, the second of that crew. And next to him rode lustful lectury, upon a bearded goat, whose rugged hair and wally eyes the sign of jealousy, was like the person's self whom he did bear, who, rough and black and filthy, did appear, unseemly man to please fair lady's eye, yet he of ladies oft was loved dear, when fairer faces were bid stand and by. Oh, who does know the bent of women's fantasy? In a green gown he clothed was full fair, which underneath did hide his filthiness. And in his hand a burning heart he bare, full of vain follies and newfangleness. For he was false and fraught with fickleness, and learned had to love with secret looks, and well could dance and sing with ruefulness, and fortunes tell and read in loving books and thousand other ways to bait his fleshly hooks. Inconstant man that loved all he saw, and lusted after all that he did love, ne would his looser life be tied to law, but joyed weak women's hearts to tempt and prove, if from their loyal loves he might them move, which lewdness filled him with reproachful pain of that foul evil, which all men reprove, that rots the marrow and consumes the brain. Such one was lechery, the third of all this train. And greedy avarice by him did ride upon a camel, loaden all with gold. Two iron coffers hung on either side, with precious metal full as they might hold. And in his lap an heap of coin he told, for of his wicked pelf his god he made, and unto hell himself for money sold. A cursed usury was all his trade, and right and wrong alike in equal balance weighed. His life was nigh unto death's door replaced, and threadbare coat and cobbled shoes he wear. Nick scarce good morsel all his life did taste, but both from back and belly still did spare to fill his bags, and riches to compare. Yet child and a kinsman living had he none to leave them to, but thorough daily care to get, and nightly fear to lose his own, he led a wretched life unto himself unknown. Most wretched wight, whom nothing might suffice, whose greedy lust did lack in greatest store, whose need had end but no end covetous, whose wealth was want, whose plenty made him poor, who had enough, 
yet wished evermore a vile disease, and eke in foot and hand a grievous gout tormented him full sore, that well he could not touch, nor go, nor stand. Such one was avarice, the fourth of this fair band. And next to him malicious envy rode upon a ravenous wolf, and still did chaw between his cankered teeth a venomous toad, that all the poison ran about his chaw, but inwardly he chawed his own maw at neighbor's wealth that made him ever sad. For death it was when any good he saw, and wept that cause of weeping none he had, but when he heard of harm he wexed wondrous glad. All in a kirtle of discolored say he clothed was, it painted full of eyes, and in his bosom secretly there lay an hateful snake, the which his tail uptized in many folds, and mortal sting implies. Still as he rode he gnashed his teeth to see those heaps of gold with gripple covetes, and grudged at the great felicity of proud Lucifera and his own company. He hated all good works and virtuous deeds, and him no less that any like did use, and who with gracious bread the hungry feeds, his alms for want of faith he doth accuse. So every good to bad he doth abuse, and eke the verse of famous poet's wit he does backbite and spiteful poison spews from leprous mouth on all that ever writ. Such one vile envy was that fifth in row did sit. And him beside rides fierce revenging wrath upon a lion, loath for to be led, and in his hand a burning brand he hath, the which he brandisheth about his head. His eyes did hurl forth sparkles fiery red, and stared stern on all that him beheld, as ashes pale of hue and seeming dead, and on his dagger still his hand he held, trembling through hasty rage when choler in him swelled. His roughened raiment all was stained with blood, which he had spilt, and all to rags arent, through unadvised rashness walks and wood. For of his hands he had no government, ne cared for blood in his avengement, but when the furious fit was overpast, his cruel facts he often would repent. Yet, willful man, he never would forecast how many mischiefs should ensue his heedless hast. Full many mischiefs follow cruel wrath, abhorred bloodshed and tumultuous strife, unmanly murder and unthrifty scath, bitter despite, with rancor's rusty knife, and fretting grief the enemy of life. All these and many evils mow haunt ire, the swelling spleen and frenzy raging rife, the shaking palsy and St. Francis' fire. Such one was wrath, the last of this ungodly tire. And after all, upon the wagon beam rode Sathan, with a smarting whip in hand, with which he forward lashed the lazy team, so oft as sloth still in the mire did stand, huge routs of people did about them band, shouting for joy, and still before their way a foggy mist had covered all the land, and underneath their feet all scattered lay dead skulls and bones of men whose life had gone astray. So forth they marched, and in this goodly sort, to take the solace of the open air, and in fresh flowering fields themselves to sport. Amongst the rest rode that false lady fair, the foul Duessa, next unto the chair of proud Lucifer, as one of the train, but that good knight would not so nigh repair, himself estranging from their joyance vain, whose fellowship seemed far unfit for warlike swain. So, having solaced themselves a space with pleasance of the breathing fields, if ed, they back returned to the princely place. Whereas an errant knight in arms a led, and heathenish shield, wherein with letters read was writ sans joy, they knew arrived find, inflamed with fury and fierce hardihead, he seemed in heart to harbor thoughts unkind, and nourish bloody vengeance in his bitter mind. 
who, when the shamed shield of slain sans for he spied, with that same fairy champion's page, bewraying him that did of late destroy his elder's brother, burning all with rage, he to him leapt, and that same envious gage of victor's glory from him snatched away. But Delphin knight, which ought that warlike wage, disdained to lose the meedy one in fray, and him recountering fierce, rescued the noble prey. Therewith they gan to hurtlin greedily, redoubted battle ready to derain, and clash their shields and shake their swords on high, that with the stir they troubled all the train, till that great queen, upon eternal pain of high displeasure, that ensue in might, commanded them their fury to refrain, and if that either to that shield had right, in equal lists they should the morrow next it fight. Ah, dearest dame, quoth then the pain in bold, pardon the error of enraged wight, whom great grief made forget the reins to hold of reason's rule, to see this recreant knight, no knight, but treacher full of false despite and shameful treason, who through guile hath slain the prowess knight that ever field did fight, even stout sense foy. Oh, who can then refrain? whose shield he bears when versed, the more to heap disdain. And to augment the glory of his guile, his dearest love, the fair Fidessa, lo, is there possessed of the traitor vile, who reaps the harvest sown by his foe, sown in bloody field and bought with woe, that brother's hand shall dearly well requite, so be, O queen, you equal favor show. Him little answered the angry elf and knight, he never meant with words, but swords, to plead his right. But through his gauntlet, as a sacred pledge, his cause in combat the next day to try. So been they parted both, with hearts on edge, to be avenged, each on his enemy. That night they pass in joy and jollity, feasting and courting both in bower and hall. For Stuart was excessive gluttony that of his plenty poured forth to all, which done the chamberlain's sloth did to rest them call. Now, when as darksome night had all displayed her coal-black curtain over brightest sky, the warlike youths on dainty couches laid did chase away sweet sleep from a sluggish eye to muse on means of hoped victory. But when as Morpheus had with leaden mace arrested all that courtly company, up rose Duessa from her resting place, and to the Paynim's lodging comes with silent pace, whom broad awake she finds in troublous fit, forecasting how his foe he might annoy, and him moves with speeches seeming fit. Ah, dear sans joy, next dearest to sans foy, cause of my new grief, cause of my new joy, joyous to see his image in mine eye, and grieved to think how foe did him destroy that was the flower of grace and chivalry. Lo, his Fidessa, to thy secret faith I fly. With gentle words he can her fairly greet, and bad say on the secret of her heart. Then sighing soft, I learn that little sweet oft-tempered is, quoth she, with muckle smart. For since my breast was launched with lovely dart of dear sense foy, I never joyed hour, but in eternal woes my weaker heart have wasted, loving him with all my power, and for his sake have felt full many and heavy stour. At last, when perils all I weened past, and hoped to reap the crop of all my care, into new woes unweeting I was cast by this false fater, who unworthy wear his worthy shield, whom he with guileful snare and trappet slew, and brought to shameful grave. Me, silly maid, away with him he bare, and ever since hath kept in darksome cave, for that I would not yield that to sense foy I gave. But since fair sun hath spursed that lowering cloud, and to my loathed life now shows some light, 
Under your beams I will me safely shroud From dreaded storm of his disdainful spite. To you the inheritance belongs By right of brother's praise. To you eke longs his love. Let not his love, let not his restless sprite Be unrevenged that calls to you above From wandering Stygian shores Where it doth endless move. Thereto said he, fair dame, be not dismayed for sorrows past, their grief is with them gone. Nay yet of present peril be afraid, for needless fear did never vantage none, and helpless hap it booteth not to moan. Dead is sans foy, his vital pains are past, though grieved ghost for vengeance deep do groan. He lives that shall him pay his duties last, and guilt he elf in blood shall sacrifice in haste. Oh, but I fear the fickle freaks, quoth she, of fortune false, and odds of arms in field. Why, dame, quoth he, what odds can ever be, where both do fight alike to win or yield? Yea, but, quoth she, he bears a charmed shield and eke enchanted arms, that none can pierce, nor none can wound the man that does them wield. Charmed or enchanted, answered he then fierce, I know which wreck, nay you the like need to rehearse. But fair Fidessa, Scythian's fortune's guile or enemy's power hath now kept tithe at you. Return from whence ye came, and rest a while, till morrow next that I the elf subdue, and with Sansfoy's dead dowry you endue. Ay, me, that is a double death, she said, with proud foe's sight my sorrow to renew. Wherever yet I be, my secret aid shall follow you. So passing forth, she him obeyed. End of Book One, Canto Four. Recording by Thomas Copeland.